And, and that's why I say Bretton Woods 3 won't work as a replacement for the dollar. But if you start getting clusters of countries together saying, well, we'd rather break the whole system to have self-reliance, a smaller, simpler economy, uh, you know, with more clustered uh, imports just coming from a, a small select groups of countries we really trust, and therefore no danger of US sanctions and no need to keep buying dollars and putting them in the bank. Right. You know, the central bank. That can really start to see things implode. And even the Financial Times has been talking about a recent policy paper from some very credible high-level uh, you know, international macroeconomists saying this is a threat that hadn't been conceived of until recently because everyone has quite correctly pointed out the renminbi will never replace the dollar, the ruble won't do it, nothing will work, gold won't work, none of them will work. But that doesn't mean you can't blow everything up rather than replacing it. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. It increasingly appears we're entering a multipolar world different from the recent era of globalization largely directed by the USA. The majority of folks who watch this Wealthion channel are from Western countries. So to bring us up to speed on the key developments that the BRICS countries are up to that should have our attention, I'm pleased to welcome Michael Every back onto the program. Michael is global strategist at Rabobank. It is based out of Singapore. Michael, thanks so much for staying up late to join us. Now you're very welcome. Always a pleasure to be here. Well, thank you, Michael. Um, well, look, a lot has happened in the world since the last time you were on this program. Lots to talk with you about. Just to get started, though, if I can kick off with my normal question, I like to ask everybody at the beginning of these discussions, what's your current assessment of the global economy and financial markets? Well, that's a great question, a very good place to start. A word that I hear a lot from other people is unprecedented. And what I normally say to them is, well, you haven't looked at very many precedents, if, <laughs> if that's what you're calling unprecedented. Obviously, you never go in the same river twice. So there are lots of new things we're seeing now. But overall, we're seeing echoes and confluences of past experiences playing out together. So it's only if you live your life looking at a Bloomberg screen that you think that everything we're seeing is new, but that doesn't stop it being a real headache for most of us. That's a really good way to say it. Um, and, and you know, we, we've had this relatively tranquil period. Um, I mean, really for a couple of decades pu punctuated by the global financial crisis, and then more recently by the pandemic. But if you if you remove you know two thousand eight two thousand nine and you know really just a year you know a little less uh, from the pandemic response, it's been this sort of I don't know you know relatively tranquil time both geopolitically but also the markets just kind of went higher year after year. You could buy the dip, you could just buy a sector fund and kind of set it and forget it, and everything did well. So to that kind of person, yeah, if, if that's maybe your only frame of reference, then what's happening here really probably does feel pretty unprecedented. But you're saying, look, you know, human history and the world and markets, they existed long before that, that relatively recent period. And as you say, there's, there's echoes of the past on a lot of what we're talking about here. And I, I hope to dig into those with you here. Um, let me start, though, if we can, with a few questions about central banks, um, mostly just to get them out of the way, because I do want to talk about a lot of the um, the trends that are being driven in large part these days. Uh, the action's happening outside the U.S., but it is going to impact those of us living here in the West. Um, I guess high level question with the central banks here is what's what's changed the game for them recently has been inflation. And most central banks worldwide are in an inflation fighting mode right now. Certainly the Fed is... It's what it says it's priority number one through three is right now. Will they have the fortitude to destroy demand enough to tame inflation the way they want to here? Or do you think that events are going to force their hands before that happens? That's the key question. Everybody has their own answer to it. Um, my view is that the Fed is more likely to do so than some others. And even if it doesn't and it starts backing off, that will be the signal to some others to be even more dovish than the Fed relatively. So I find it hard to look at the global context, which is important for looking at exchange rates, for example, 
and say that America will be unequivocally more dovish. And if you want one very quick example of that, there's sure. an excellent article in the Australian press, in the Australian Financial Review, a great newspaper, which just came out asking, uh, is the RBA a chicken or a dove? Uh, and pointing out that if you listen carefully to what they've just said, not only have they paused rates at the dizzying height of 3.6% in <laughs> Australia, when they've got inflation double that, a multi-decade low in unemployment, uh, and a red hot labor market where everyone who wants a job can get one. So not only have they got that backdrop, they're now saying 3.6 is probably the top. They've just paused. They're suggesting they might have to do a bit more, but they're basically keeping their fingers and toes crossed and hoping they don't have to. They're pretending that productivity growth will pick up. So therefore there won't be any inflation coming through on the wages side. And effectively, you know, the, the financial press down there are asking, is this it? Because the other thing I should add is that they've just also said we don't mind getting inflation back down to the top end of a two to three, two, two to three percent range a year later than we originally thought, because we don't want people to lose their jobs. So that's that's our that's the RBA who used to be considered a credible central bank. So that doesn't answer the question about what the Fed will do. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to prevaricate, but it does suggest if they're going to crumble, everyone else is going to crumble a whole heap more. And so far, I'm not seeing too many signs of them crumbling. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so a couple of things to just note there. Um, Australia, you mentioned, and it has announced a pause uh, in its, its rate hikes. Um, Canada has announced one too. Uh, I think India just announced one recently too. So we're beginning to see this, this wave of pausing coming along. Um, I'll ask you in a moment whether you think the Fed is going to pause or not, too, because there's a lot of speculation that they likely will at this point in time. Um, <clears throat> but I remember talking to you, you, uh, Michael, wasn't the last time you were on, it was probably the time or two before then. And I, I, if I remember correctly, you made a comment that one of the things that the central banks can't stomach is too much wage inflation. Right, that that's been um, you know a big dynamic over the past forty plus years um, is is that the, uh, the labor has really sort of lost the power battle um, versus central central planning in general, and I think central planning kind of like that <laughs> to a certain extent. Um, now we have pretty high wage inflation, and um, you know that's certainly something I, I think, if I understand you correctly something that the central banks, you know, don't want to have becoming an ongoing issue that, that they have to fight. Um, I don't know as much of the rest of the world, but certainly here in the States, um, <clears throat> it's interesting. Real wages have still not been growing, but that's because inflation has been so high. But labor costs have really gone up a fair amount um, and, and don't yet see any, any uh, signs of, of coming down, although we'll talk about layoffs in just a second, we kind of have this interesting dynamic right now where, where wages are going up, but companies are beginning to shed their workforces and obviously something there's gonna to have to give at some point in time. But um, on this topic of sort of central banks versus uh, you know wage inflation, do, do you have any sort of updated thoughts on that? Uh, I do, they still don't like it, even though politicians now recognize that without it, we're heading for a very, very ugly uh, period. Uh, and I think there's broad recognition of that. But here's an interesting way of looking at it. Most economists you talk to only look at one economy or maybe two, you know, three would be a real push. And that, that's a lot to be looking at. Let's talk about the US. There are genuine questions to be asked about the quality of US labor market data. Now, I'd rather not dive into that here, because I think there are other guests who I'm sure you talk to have a, a more granular view on that. But what I can say is you can get one data series wrong like that, but you've really got to have a conspiracy to get all the data series wrong like that. And above and beyond that, it's also true in Australia and New Zealand and the UK and every European economy and every Asian economy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very hard to say that this is fudging the statistics when it's happening absolutely everywhere. Even in emerging Asia, for example, we have an election coming up uh, next month in Thailand. And there, one of the popular policies from one of the parties expected to do well is to double the minimum wage, more than double the minimum wage, which will ripple through the entire economy because mm -hmm. a lot of people's salaries are based on it. So clearly, there's a lot of inflation and wage inflation baked into the system. And you brought up the nominal versus real wages argument, which I think is a valid one. But let's bring it back to the other point you raised, which 
we spoke about before, labor versus capital. I think the dynamic has changed there post-COVID, post-deglobalization, to a degree for now. Because when people say to me, well, real wage growth is still low, I say to them, okay, but if you're telling me capital still has all the power and labor has none, why did nominal wage growth go up at all? So, right. so headline inflation goes to 7% or 8%, whatever it is in the UK, double digits. How comes the nominal pay went up to 8 9% in some cases, you know, maybe slightly negative in some countries, slightly positive in others. If businesses have got the, you know, the whip hand, why are they not just saying no pay rise for you, like the soup Nazi and Seinfeld, off right. you go, just be poorer. And the answer is, oh, well, they can't look bad. Well, if they can't look bad, clearly there is some political dynamic there that's shifting and they understand they have to do a bit more. And I think we're going to see more of that because initially we saw it in the goods sector. With deglobalization, I think that will continue in, in some areas more than others, in some geographies more than others. And in the services sector, we're still experiencing globally what we saw in the goods sector during the peak of the, you know, the COVID panic. You try to get a really qualified worker in the tourism sector in Asia at the moment, and you see what you have to pay. They're talking about hiring ex-prisoners in some countries. So yes, there's genuinely wage inflation in the system. And there's not a lot central banks can do about it other than keep hiking or grit their teeth and pretend it isn't happening. Or in Australia's case, pretend productivity is magically going to take off and save us all from inflation. Yeah, and obviously in that last example there, uh, that strategy is a short-term one right? Because it, it either works uh, or very quickly you realize it doesn't and you got to do something else. Um, so, you know, obviously one thing that will dampen uh, wage inflation is a recession, right? Um, and I, we'll, in a moment, we'll kind of get to your, your your thoughts on on your general macro outlook and whatnot. But uh, again, going back to your statement from previous times ago, I, I sort of left that thinking, that that was a line that the central banks um, were not going to cross, meaning so, sort of like general inflation, but like, hey, if that's happening, we're going to do whatever it takes to quash that wage inflation because we don't want, for better or worse, you can like it or not like it, we don't want labor to begin to gain the upper hand on capital because we like being in control as, as the the main, um, you know, uh, wellspring of capital. You know, <laughs> we, we want to keep our control. Oh, no, absolutely. I still think that dynamic holds true, but I do think it's shifting. And it's shifting for the simple reason that we know if we try and go back to where we were previously, where capital absolutely had the whip hand over labor, everyone was sitting there suffering with you know, very, very low wage growth year after year and very high asset inflation, which sat alongside that. So you know, the smart thing to do was not to bother working at all but just to try and make money from money or buy right. crypto or any other asset. That's a dead end. That's a dead end politically for any politician pushing for it. It's a dead end socially in terms of socioeconomic stability. It's a dead end economically because you can't really push much more debt into this system, particularly at the consumer level. So we can't go back to that. And one discussion I have repeatedly with those who can put up with me long enough to have it with me is that while Marx is still looming there in the background in terms of labor versus capital. I fear that that debate and even central banking is being eclipsed to a degree by a shift from Marx to Lenin, by which I mean geopolitics, political violence, both domestically and internationally, mm -hmm. and an even more perilous situation which requires possibly the same response, but targeted in a different manner and maybe in terms of social stability, looking the other way in terms of wage inflation for a while, because um, if you need to rally around the flag, you don't do that very well telling everybody no wage hikes for you. Right, right, right. Yeah, the politicians sort of want to keep their heads to a certain extent. Um, so to, to maybe put a little judgment on this, um, are, are you sort of saying that um, we, we may be entering an era where labor has more power? I'm not going to say the upper hand yet but they've got more power and the cost for that uh, for, for us as regular people is that things are going to be more expensive um 
the, but the benefit is is that we have a little bit more equitable of a society that that the all the power isn't getting hoovered up by the by the zero point one percent every anymore. We're not there yet, but I think you can make a very credible case that we might be heading in that direction for a number of different conflated reasons. Um, obviously, I just said you know what we tried before is now seen as a failed model. Now, obviously, Wall Street would love to see more of it. That's why they're clamoring for immediate rate cuts. Right. Uh, there are some politicians who would. I mean, in the US, you've got politicians who are pushing to reintroduce child labor, which is a great way of pushing down wage rates, uh, something which we haven't done in Europe for, you know, 100 and something years, and I hope we don't go back to. But you can certainly see some people are trying to push for that. But I think there's a broad consensus that we need to find a new way out of it. And even some central banks, slowly, grudgingly, are starting to recognize that. But I think the interesting thing is, in doing so, we have to accept that the entire system doesn't work and it isn't something where you just flick a switch and effortlessly move from one state to another. There'll be a transition process, which is gonna be bumpy and messy, but I do think will be unavoidable. Okay, uh, bumpy, messy, yet unavoidable. Okay, so here's where we begin to get into the really interesting questions. Um, I guess first is, we mentioned all these banks that are pausing, um, the Fed, Curious to know if you have any strong opinions one way or the other, <clears throat> but they basically said, look, we're still committed to getting inflation under control, but we we believe we're near the, <clears throat> the end of our hiking cycle. Um, and uh, we might need to go you know, a little bit higher from here. But Powell talked about, he's talked about two things in the past. One, um, that following the banking crisis, that uh, bank lending standards are tightening in response to that, and he's saying that actually acts like a substitute for additional rate hikes, right? So we want to kind of see how extreme that's going to be. And he also has been warning about the lag effect of uh, raising the Fed funds rate uh, as far and as quickly as he has, right? Where those those sort of shock waves travel through time because it takes about a yearish or so before the Fed makes a rate hike before it's fully experienced in the economy. So he, and this makes sense to me that, you know, saying, hey, pretty soon I want to pause because I, I want to see how impactful each of those, you know, traveling through time shock waves are going to be as those lag effects begin to slam into the economy. Um, do you do you sort of see the, the, the global panoply of central banks getting to a, the pause stage pretty soon and then seeing what happens? Um, or do you see a material chance of, of you know, a lot more hikes or, or a surprise pivot or anything like that? Okay, again, great question. The nitty gritty is this. You can certainly see that a preponderance of central banks are looking to try and pause fairly soon. And you've had one policymaker or one rate setter, I should say, in the Bank of England already saying we should be cutting by now already when you've got near double digit inflation and 20% odd food inflation, which is just bizarro, but you know, this is what the pressure is is building towards. Yes, yeah. you can see that. But this isn't happening in a vacuum. We've just discussed very briefly the secular labor market dynamics, and they're not going to go away. In most of the Western economies we're talking about, you have an aging population. And there's a popular misconception that an aging population is deflationary because people look at Japan and say, well, look at Japan. Well, Japan had a burst bubble. That's why it's deflationary in Japan. Right. But in the interim, while your population is aging before it starts actually physically collapsing, you have a lot more elderly people who aren't working, but you have the same number of people eating and doing things, and you have fewer young people who need to be doing all the things. So you have an inverted pyramid demographically, and you have fewer young people who need to basically be doing multiple different jobs. Ergo, you bid up the wage rate for them. And at the same time, you know, elderly people need to sell their assets in order to retire. Uh, there's another meme that, you know, they need high stock prices to retire. Yeah, but then you sell them to get your annuity. And who are you going to sell them to? Not the elderly. You have to sell them to the young. So the young have to have money in order to buy them off of you and look after the whole scheme, the whole pyramid. So you can see a secular argument from the labor market there. But that's just one factor here. The other one is something that you raised earlier on, uh, which is the geopolitical backdrop in terms of what is and isn't money, what is and isn't value, what does the global architecture look like going forward? And will central banks be allowed 
to pause or pivot. Just to, let me just throw one quick point before you ask the next question. Sure, just imagine sure, this. Please. Just imagine tomorrow we get a shock headline. Pal comes out and says, I was wrong. You were all right. I'm going to slash rates 200 basis points, similar to what we saw you know, a couple of decades ago. Everyone else is, thank goodness, the Australians start dancing around their barbecues, which they would do. Um, you know, absolute, absolute joy breaks out everywhere. What do you think the oil price would be? Right. What do you think? What do you think metals prices would be? What do you think grains prices would be? Now, unless all the central banks know something we don't about a global calamity that's about to hit us, they're basically just saying we can't do this inflation fighting business. And that's when it would start to get into the more existential, esoteric, what is and isn't money kind of sphere. And that gets really, really messy really messy, really, really fast. So I can understand they want to pause. Some of them are suggesting they really are going to, others are just waiting and seeing. But it all comes down to both the labor market dynamic, which they can't control, which is partly driven by geopolitics, and the larger geopolitical backdrop of what does the architecture look like going forwards, to which we don't know, but I would suggest not one in which we can get away with trying to replicate what we did in 2008, which is cutting rates to zero or negative and printing money via QE or printing bank reserves via QE to be accurate. Okay, uh, great answer. It's a great segue to the next section here where I have a, a bunch of questions about what's happening geopolitically. would love to get your, your um, seasoned uh, insights on. Real quick, just on ending this, this point for a second. Sort of where I was driving with, with all of this is to the extent that the central banks are committed to getting inflation tamed or, or, or doing everything they can to get it tamed before some sort of systemic break forces their hand, is right now we have a big disconnect. In fact, the, the, the biggest uh, that we've seen yet this year between where the Fed is guiding the market uh, on interest rates and where the market thinks interest rates are going to be. So um, I'll put up a chart here. Uh, it's, it's Bloomberg data that Zero Hedge puts up a lot, um, but they basically show that where the market Fed funds rate is projected going out versus where the Fed dot plot is projecting. And right now, there's just a massive divergence between the two, where the Fed is saying, hey, look, you know, I might pause. Powell's saying, I might pause, but then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold it through the rest of the year because I want to wait and see that lag effect. And what I'm really trying to make sure is that we're bringing demand down to bring inflation down. And the market's basically saying, nah, we don't believe you. You're going to start cutting as soon as you know, early summer. Um, so uh, at some point, that gap is going to have to resolve, right? Either the, the Fed is going to blink or the markets are going to say, oh, you know what? We were overly optimistic here. So there's there's highly likely going to have to be a repricing done in here somewhere. Do, do, do you see that as sort of a, you know, we've got sort of a, a Wild West, you know, high noon uh, showdown mm -hmm. right now. And at, at some point, one of those two is going to win. And, and I'm curious if you have a gut feel which one you think may win out. Uh, okay, in this high west shootout, um, already this year we've seen several mini episodes of that where the Fed blows the market away. Or maybe if we're using a you know a high a high noon shootout analogy, they blow their hat off. Perhaps they haven't shot okay. the head yet. It's, it's it's a warning. You know, I can do that if I want to. So Great analogy. That's that's happened a few times already. And if you stick to the the marks view of things which I have done for most of my professional career of you know, two and a half decades in, the, in this industry, you would say that the market is right and the Fed doesn't know what it's talking about. And that's been my message for many, many years. But if you take a Lenin view, which is that we're in a much more existential struggle in terms of understanding what is and isn't value, what is and isn't money, who does and doesn't write the rules of the global game, no then the Fed's the one with all the bullets and it's the market that will have to be forced to reprice again, as it already has done several times over the past 12 months. All right. Hey, is it is it for, for those who don't understand uh, the, the scope of, of, you know, history and, and the economic uh, and geopolitical parties you're talking about, like, you know, Marx and Lenin and the body of their work and how they play, is, is it Am I correct in sort of distilling your, your latest point there to being, you know, in a Marxist system, things follow a rule set where in a, in a Lenin type system, it's just sort of whoever has the power decides what happens. 
right? In other words, like, yeah, there are rules, but we'll break them if we have to. That's a nice summary. I mean, effectively, the Marx argument in this context is that, yeah, you can squeeze the poor and the middle class as much as you want, but then everything breaks. So it's a really good short term strategy and even a multi decade strategy for those who are doing it until everything collapses as a result. But the context of the Lenin one is exactly as you said, uh, you know, as, as Vladimir Lenin said, when leading the Russian Revolution, power was lying there in the street. And that's the issue now. Where is power lying? Is someone going to bend down and pick it up? And I think monetary policy is being sucked up into that. And hopefully we're going to segue to this in a second. But on that front, I, I discuss this with colleagues and with, and with uh, you know, with clients and with the media. And a lot of people don't follow me when I start going down this route, to be fair. They either are unwilling to or maybe they haven't learned quite enough reading on it. I get that. I completely get that. But I did have one discussion where I said, look, even SVB, what happened to SVB recently? I said, that's a national security issue. That isn't just about a banking crisis and an interest rate hedging mismatch. There's national security there, I guarantee you. And that wasn't a popular view with everybody. Lo and behold, about a week later, you had Defense One, which is uh, you know one of these uh, Pentagon-based you know newsletters coming out and saying that the Pentagon actually had guys on standby watching SVB closely because yes, it was absolutely seen as national security. And they've actually set up an office of strategic capital just to make sure that anything else that fails going forwards isn't going to fail on the Pentagon's watch. So this is this is part of a larger thesis that I've got that I oh. will continue out now. But there are more important games being played than just up and down and looking at lines on charts. All right. Well, uh, that's fascinating. And let's yes, use that as the segue to get into you know what is really happening happening on the geopolitical and global power chessboard. Um, well, look, you've got a very valuable outside the West perspective. Right. You've lived and worked in Southeast Asia for a good chunk of your life. Um, if I remember correctly, you spent a good chunk of your youth living in Russia, correct? Yeah, um, <laughs> I wouldn't say a huge chunk, but I, I spent time there. Yeah, and Eastern right. Europe. Okay. Um, so anyways, you you have a literally, you know, somebody living in these countries uh, perspective of what's going on. And then, of course, your whole professional um, area of expertise studying these companies from a, a, a macroeconomic standpoint. Um so let, let me just throw a couple of questions at you. And then if I don't ask anything really key, please add it to the discussion. Um, first off, just purely economically for a second, China is now opening back up, um, lifting its its draconian COVID restrictions. How meaningful to global growth, global inflation, um, and uh, and staving off, and, and sorry, um, uh, yeah, sort of potentially pushing off if, if, if we were headed towards a global recession, you know, does this materially kind of push off the arrival date of that? Um, or is this not as big of a deal as, as some people have been thinking? It doesn't matter in the slightest. Chinese okay, growth is for China. Ch Chinese growth is for China. We're probably going to have a decent burst of growth this year, short term, not because of the same kind of revenge spending that you've had elsewhere, because nobody got given any support during COVID in China. So people are feeling really pretty flat and miserable compared to how they felt in the West when they were all cashed up and, you know, buying everything over the internet. Um, but, you know, this year you will get a bounce just mathematically, if nothing else. But any growth you get is for China. That's how their system is set up. That's one of the reasons why we have the global tensions that we do. I have no excitement about Chinese growth driving anything or leaning against any kind of Western recession going forwards. None. Okay, interesting. I've heard, and I want to see if I can remember who it was. It might have been Louis Gov, who studies Europe and said, "Oh, there, you know, some countries there that do a lot of business with China that should see, you know, a material." You, you, that, you're saying no. He's wrong. He's completely wrong. He's very, very pro-China. Nice guy, but he's very, 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 very wrong on that. Yeah. For example, you know, one quick bullet point on that: China is the EU's biggest trade partner, absolutely, but it's imports that are going through the roof. So it's cheap uh, electric vehicles from China to Europe, which are a real threat long term to its auto industry, for example. That's what's going through the roof. Europe exports over twice as much to the US as it does to China. Uh, so the US is still the number one export market. And if the US grows, Europe sells more jobs for Europe. So that's the dynamic Europe still needs to be thinking about. China is just doing China. Okay, so if you're watching the macroeconomic global data and seeing the global economy slow down and sputter here, China's not going to be your white knight riding to its rescue. No, 
Okay. okay. Um, all right. Well, conversation that's had a lot of discussion recently in the media, um, the, the rush towards de-dollarization and the um, confederation, the increasing confederation of the BRICS countries, both in terms of just being trade partners in general, um, but also starting to strike, strike deals that are not in the dollar. And then, of course, there's this discussion of kind of a new BRICS currency that's going to emerge at some point and, and begin to challenge the, uh, the U.S. dollar's you know, preeminence as the world reserve currency. Um, how serious is this and, and how immediate is the threat if the threat is serious? I think this is a really important discussion to be having, and I'm delighted to have the opportunity to do it in a bit more depth than I normally get given here. Normally, I get 15 seconds for a sound bite. <laughs> it's just it takes, it off minutes, takes 15 minutes, whatever you need. Yeah. Okay. It, it, it really is a desperately important issue, but not in the way it's popularly understood. So let's let's look at the market as a whole. You know, everyone in the market talking about this. I, I would comfortably suggest 90% of analysts have no idea what's going on. If you talk about what you were just alluding to, which is being called Breton Woods 3, that's the title within finance, financial Twitter, FinTwit, mm -hmm. that has been given for you know, a year and a half now. Um, yeah, nine out of 10 analysts look blankly off into space. If you ask them, what's your view on that? You know, all they're doing basically is looking at spot prices for X, Y, or Z and up a bit or down a bit. It's kind of like the price is right, that game show. Yeah. That's, that's effectively what their financial an analysis is. Another 9%, roughly, so one in 10 of those, are running around screaming, uh, you know, buy the renminbi, buy gold, buy the ruble, because the sky is falling, that's it, it's the end of the dollar, the US is done, we're the last one to leave, please turn out the lights, etc. And I would like to think, even though I'm probably flattering myself here, there's only about 1% of the market that are saying, it is very important that we discuss this. What is being attempted by some of these countries does matter, but there's not the faintest possibility of them replicating or replacing the global dollar system, which is what all of us operate within. Um, and I actually published a big piece of work on that last year called Why Bretton Woods 3 Won't Work, with some... Uh, Interesting charts, which maybe we can uh, we can share in a moment. Absolutely, uh, showing, some the, showing some of the balance sheets and the maths of it. And I re I repeated the exercise a little bit earlier this year with another one called uh, Eastern Powers in Gold Member, which was a deliberate play on Austin Powers in Gold Member. That's and super. I have yeah, yeah, but, that is a great play of words there. Thank you very much. But the answer it was not yeah, baby. It was no, baby. This is this is this is not going to work. But while I therefore appear to be dismissing it, I'm also talking about how important it is from a much more boring technical perspective. Because if what we see going forwards is more and more large emerging markets, <clears throat> we're talking about the BRICS, but it can be others. For example, Malaysia mm -hmm. and India were talking about doing something just two weeks ago. If we start seeing more and more emerging markets in general, just saying we will price trade in US dollars as we do now. So the dollar price of the object remains, but we are going to clear bilateral trade in a third party currency, for example, an Indian rupees, Malaysian ringgit, uh, Kenyan shillings or whatever. And in order to replicate that or to allow that to continue, we're going to move to try and just balance trade off. Mm -hmm. So I'll sell you $100 million worth of X, you sell me $100 million worth of Y, we net the two currencies out. If that starts to happen on scale, and it's happening in pockets in some locations, and it's being talked about for commodities in renminbi in other locations, if that happens, you start to move back to global barter. Mm -hmm. Now, if you move back to global barter, that is how all of us are mistaught economic history. We're all taught in our textbook, we started with barter and then we moved on to uh, gold. And then after that, you know, we moved on to paper money and now we should all go back to gold. That's actually not true. If you, if you read the, the anthropology of it, if you read uh, uh, Pogliani or, or David Graeber, Debt, the First 5,000 Years, wonderful mm -hmm. read, you'll find out actually we started with debt 
everywhere. Debt is what always came first of all, rather than barter. But barter is nonetheless a very, very basic trading system. And there's a reason why we don't do it because it's really, really inefficient and it sees supply chains start to freeze because everything has to clear, otherwise you end up with a, a surplus where you don't want one. So that's what is an, the immediate worry. Um, if you start to see that happening, the dollar system as it remains, the Euro dollar system in particular outside the US still yeah. sits there. All the architecture sits there, all the debt sits there, all the derivatives sit there, all the invoicing, you know, on a high level or within Wall Street sits there. But country after country could potentially at the margin just start saying, well, you know, we don't like this system so much. We're just going to do less trade, accumulate fewer dollars and just try and clear bilaterally here in one currency, there in another currency. They'll trade with another country in that currency. Can you imagine what a patchwork quilt this is? And, and that's why I say Bretton Woods 3 won't work as a replacement for the dollar. But if you start getting clusters of countries together saying, well, we'd rather break the whole system to have self-reliance, a smaller, simpler economy, uh, you know, with more clustered uh, imports just coming from a, a small select groups of countries we really trust, and therefore no danger of US sanctions and no need to keep buying dollars and putting them in the bank, right? Uh, you know, the central bank, that can really start to see things implode. And even the Financial Times has been talking about a recent policy paper from some very credible high level, uh, you know, international macroeconomists saying this is a threat that hadn't been conceived of until recently, because everyone has quite correctly pointed out the renminbi will never replace the dollar, the ruble won't do it, nothing will work, gold won't work, none of them will work. But that doesn't mean you can't blow everything up rather than replacing it. Okay, so I want to talk about what blowing up would look like. Um, real quickly, uh, Zoltan Posnar has written um, uh, a lot about the bifurcation or, or fragmentation of global trade. And one of the points that he's made, and I'm curious to get your thoughts on this, is forget about the pricing for a moment, um, or the mechanism of pricing, but um, just think of supply. And he's saying, hey, you know, because most of these BRICS countries um, are resource producers, uh, if they start doing more and more of these deals that you're talking about, you know, these almost global barter deals directly with one another, you know, he's saying that, that more and more of the global commodity supply is going to be encumbered, is his word, um, uh, by these BRICS countries, which means yeah, sure. U.S. and you know, Team America, other Western countries, uh, you can you can buy commodities. In fact, to your point, you can probably still buy them with dollars, no problem. But you might not be able to buy all that you want. When the price may be higher, and B, you might not be able to buy all you want the way that you're so accustomed to because an increasing amount of the supply is getting locked into these side by side trade deals that are going on. Um, how, how material a factor is that in your mind? It is a factor. Um, I like a lot of what Zoltan says, even if Zero Hedge was tweeting about me a few weeks ago, Michael Every really hates Zoltan because uh, you know, I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I did mock him in that Eastern Powers in Gold member because he put out a last piece called War and Peace, I believe. And, uh, you know, my, my joke was uh, war and pieces of gold are not going to push the dollar aside. So, you know, it, it was a, mo a mocking of part of the argument. I don't think he's wrong in all aspects of what he's seeing. In fact, I think he understands quite a lot of it very well. What he's failing to see is twofold. And I'll, I'll try and summarize it quickly and then maybe we can expand it. The first one's this, any cluster of these BRICS economies together doesn't work. You, you can do the trade map. And again, I'll, I'll, I'll put up the chart for that in a second. Uh, and you can see like a, a, a three dimensional map of a hypothetical kind of BRICS world with Latin America and Africa and South Asia and East Asia, et cetera, et cetera, how they all trade together. And the answer is they don't. If you've got a lot of commodity producers who all run large trade surpluses, what are they all going to do? Just swap coal for meat endlessly? Mm -hmm. Is Turkmenistan and, Ka Turkmenistan and Kazakhstan just going to sell gas to each other? And, you know, the only way that cluster of countries works is if they sell all the commodities to China 
And then China has to sell all the manufactured goods back to them, and their markets are still quite small, or has to sell all of the commodities to the, U to the US and Europe in particular, who will immediately sever those ties if that world starts to emerge. So that's why I'm saying everything can bifurcate and blow up. Now, is that painful for the West? You bet your boots. You bet your boots that's painful for the West if that happens. Is that disastrous for these commodity economies? Absolutely, you can double bet your boots. Is that bad news for China? Completely. The last thing they want is to see that happening at the moment. Now, if we push them into a corner, might they do that? Sure. As I was alluding to, that blows everything up. It doesn't create a new global system. It just shatters everything for everybody. So you don't want to be running to sell the dollar in that environment because the US still looks really good in a world where suddenly it's one, one uh, no, excuse me, not all for one and one for all. It's each for themselves. In that environment, the, dollar, the US is still huge. Globally, yep. So the dollar would do well in that environment. So that's, that's the first point. All right, and, and so sorry to interject, just to make sure yeah. I'm following. In, in, that, yeah. in that scenario where the whole thing blows yeah. up, there are no winners. Everybody no winners. gets hurt. The U.S. just everybody gets hurt gets a lot hurt. less than everybody else. Yeah, I mean, and it still gets hurt. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But, I mean, look, you've got, you've got Trump trying to run the 2024 without getting too party political. And he's openly running on a platform of bring back mercantilism, which is mm -hmm. a word I've been using since 2015. You have. And I would bet very few people even knew what it meant up until recently, which is, you know, running your national economy like you would a business. You sell more than you buy or you go bankrupt. And you sell high value stuff, you buy low value. Okay, that's-, that's That what sounds crazy, but but yeah. Yeah, but well, not everyone said, we don't do that, we do free trade, et cetera. And I said, no, you don't. You will secretly want to do mercantilism. You don't know what the word means. He's openly running on that. Could the US do that? Again, yes, they could. You've got the Wall Street Journal saying, just in the last few days, the US is back in the factory business. Now they're automated. They're not employing the same number of people that they used to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can automate those jobs. You can bring supply chains back. All it needs is a national security push, the Defense Production Act, and it can happen on steroids. That would push the dollar right the way through the roof, but everything else would be blowing up at the same time. So that's the first point. And the second one brings us right the way back to central banks. And I'm glad the conversation has gone this way because it's, it's gone exactly where I wanted it to go. Good. Which is, if you're, if you're a central bank sitting there and you don't understand this, and frankly, I don't think many do, and you try and cut rates, you'll find out what's going on in this particular environment pretty quickly. But if you do get it, what's the one thing you don't want to see? You don't want to see people dropping the dollar and doing bilateral barter because that's really bad for the euro dollar system because they're not earning dollars, which means they can't repay euro dollar debts, which means you have a crisis building up in the system somewhere in emerging markets more than in developed markets. And you don't want to see the dollar slipping off its pedestal. So what do you do? You raise rates on the dollar. Mm -hmm. Because if you can get a nice green bag, let's say purely hypothetically, not a forecast, if you can get 7% on the dollar, which some people were starting to talk about as possible prior to SVB and Credit Suisse suddenly going wobbly, would you rather hold a cargo full of iron ore or oil or would you rather have a risk-free globally international dollar, which can be, you know, transacted for anything, anywhere, effortlessly, electronically right. or in cash, which gives you 7% with inflation coming down because commodities are deflating at the same time. So it's a hypothesis. It's not a forecast. But this is the other area where I disagree with Zoltan, because I've been saying all along reading his stuff, so raise rates to 7%, and watch it all go away. And here we are with rates of five and about to go up to five and a quarter. We're not there. But 12 months ago, that was science fiction, right? absolute science fiction. And I was saying 12 months ago, higher for longer. And I was saying it tongue in cheek because everyone around me kept saying lower for longer. And I'm like, if you look at the world through this hypothesis, you know, which I stapled together from shifting from Marx to Lenin and reading a few very interesting people around me, that suggests there's a risk of higher for longer. And that was the mantra right up until SVB. Well, interesting. And now, you know, we're talking about, we, 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 we kick this off talking about central bank policy. Um, uh, so if there isn't, you know, uh, if the market's not right and there isn't uh, a, a, a um, capitulation here by the central banks, um, who knows? We, we, we may see what that world looks like, Michael. Well, we may do. Again, it's not a forecast. I, I know you're not, you're not predicting it. You're just saying it's a hypothesis. Yeah, well, I'm a global strategist. My view is to try and look at all the moving parts everywhere all at once, which is a, such a mental exercise that, you know, frankly, you don't have any energy left at the end of the day. 
and, and try and see, is it all just random nothingness or is there actually a pattern there? And maybe I'm projecting things that aren't there. Maybe I am. But if, if I am right on this, then the risk is that, yes, even if we pause and then cut, it's a pause that doesn't refresh this mm-hmm. year rather than a pause that refreshes. And we will find out just like under Volcker, who did exactly the same thing. Hike, cut, oops, hike yep. even more. That the only way you can get inflation out of the system, particularly when you've got people like OPEC cut, OPEC plus cutting output to push oil prices back up. If you have that being replicated across commodities, you haven't got a lot of choice. Yep. And that's, I mean, that is the big question here we're sort of dancing around, right? Which is if inflation, if, if breaking it truly is um, the priority, um, you know, at the end of the day, you've got to get demand down low enough uh, to 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 both get your population's desire to spend uh, reduced, but also to break the back of of like cartels and whatnot, right? Like, all right, you're going to raise your price un- 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 uncomfortably high for us by cutting production. Okay, we're just going to kill demand so much that you're going to have to start playing ball with us. So it'd be very interesting to see. Go ahead. There's one uh, caveat to this that I'd like to stress. Uh, now I've adapted this caveat in the past couple of weeks and discussions with colleagues who, you know, I've been thrashing this out with. So I've changed how I present it, but the core idea is still the same. And that is, again, the risk, and I think we are already seeing it in one form or another, starting to crystallize in some economies, is rate hikes plus acronyms. Okay. Now I used I used to say rate hikes plus QE. And again, I w- I've been saying that for months and months and months, and even saying I want to get it on T-shirts. Um, now, some people said we've got that already post SVB because of the BTFP, right? The bank team funding program. That's not QE. Initially, it looked like it. It's a liquidity injection in terms of allowing people to not mark to market. Yeah, that's a real genuine liquidity boost. But actually, you know, it's it's lending to people against artificially priced collateral at a real interest rate. So it's not QE. But when you've got the Pentagon setting up an office of strategic capital, when you've got the ECB both selling and buying bonds at the same time, when you've got the Bank of England doing the same thing, you can completely see that there is going to come a point where central banks are logically, if we go down this path, if we go down this path, say we need higher interest rates to dampen irrelevant parts of the economy and we need an externally high interest rate to prop up our currency versus commodities and versus bricks etc etc but we don't want to see a higher interest rate for all the economy because we need parts of it such as the bits that make f-35s and tanks and stinger missiles and uh you know and uh, expand shipyards etc 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 which is where we get back to lenin rather than marx and if you're going to do that, you have to be injecting liquidity and you have to be removing liquidity simultaneously. And guess what? At the beginning, remember, I said people talk about things being unprecedented. And I said, you haven't read many precedents. Prior to the 1980s, that's exactly how we used to run the economy. We used to have credit rationing for different sectors under Bretton Woods one. We used to have differential interest rates for different sectors under Bretton Woods one. Agriculture is important this year. You get lots of credit and low interest rates. Industry isn't, you don't. Because we recognized you need more than one weapon, more than one tool to hit multiple different targets. So what I'm saying in a nutshell is we get monetary policy and fiscal policy and industrial policy all working together. And that's rate hikes plus acronyms. That That is really important, I believe, and really fascinating um, where Right now, the, the Fed largely has, you know, two levers and, and they're levers that affect everybody, right? I'm going to raise or lower interest rates or I'm going to stimulate or not, right? And you're basically saying it's now going to have many different levers that are going to be, you know, surgically targeted to different parts of the economy. All right, you guys over there, you're getting tightening, but you're important, you're getting easing, right? And that's the world we're going to live in. And as you're saying, it's it's not a new format. It's it's actually an old playbook that's been used before. It's an old playbook, and it's one that's being used. Okay, not as effectively as it should be, but it's being used for many years now in China as well. 
which is, you know, let's prioritize one sector over another, let's throw all our resources here, not there. But as we start to see this geopolitical clash, and let's hope it doesn't go kinetic, but it's still a clash, even if it doesn't, you know, between the US and China, which I think everyone watching this is cognizant of ticking away in the background. You can't undergo that kind of geopolitical challenge and say, let's do it with free trade. Let's do it with free markets. Let's do it only worried about what Wall Street's doing and what my house price is doing. That doesn't mean these things aren't important, but do we really need to be throwing capital via SVB into Instagram filters to make cats look like dogs? <laughs> or, do, or do we need to be throwing that money into something that might actually be useful for cryptography or something like DARPA used to do, which of course, you know, produced the grass, uh, you know, the grassroots and the green shoots of so many of the technological innovations, which we're all still living on the on the jet fumes of today, you know, the, the fumes of today. Right, right. Um, one of which being the internet and how you and I are communicating right now. There you go. Um, there you go. So one of my questions here is about the tensions, the rising tensions between the US and China. R real quick before I get there, um, on, on this topic of um, the fracturing of global trade and, and whatnot, um, I really want to get your opinion on this, given your background. Um, uh, the assumption for that to work is is that all these BRIC countries, BRICS countries, get along great together, right, and can act in mutually <laughs> coordinated. <laughs> You're laughing, right? so you kind of know where I'm going. And somebody recently wrote for this thing to really work, and, and you know, eventually sort of challenge the the dollar as a store of value and a world reserve currency. And I know that you're thinking it doesn't necessarily have to get there. Um, Somebody said, and this somebody might have been you, I, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember who to attribute <laughs> said to truly replace the dollar, people need to aspire to retire in China and to store their money in Moscow. That was and, me. <laughs> yes, was it you? Okay. <laughs> which I thought was such a great point, which of course that feels so foreign right now, right? Um, so, and whether that's the people who, you know, who have to support this whole regime, but maybe even just the high level of these different players, you know them well, you know China, you know Russia, they've been highly suspicious of one another for, you know, centuries. Um, they have histories of going back on their statements. Um, they have internal weaknesses that I want to ask you about in just a moment, where maybe they're not the the global, you know, superpowers that sometimes they get painted as by the West. Can this confederation hold together given the the players involved here? It's very unlikely. Uh, I mean, look, California and Florida hate each other. Um, you know, it's, but this this is that kind of tension exponentially worse, exponentially worse. It's, it's very, very hard to see. A as you correctly said, Russia and China um, obviously have a lot to collaborate on at the moment, but have a long history of tension and it's not getting a lot of play. But just relatively recently, some Chinese government websites started to refer to the territories over the border in Russia, which used to be Chinese once upon a time, by their Chinese names again. China just organized a meeting of all the Central Asian states, which were traditionally in the Soviet Union's Russian orbit, without inviting Russia. These are, hmm. these are, these are actions that absolutely cause paranoia in Moscow. But what, you know, what other choice have they got right now? So that's just one dynamic. China and India have come to blows physically, you know, with, with spiked clubs on their contentious border in the past couple of years. If you talk to anyone senior in Indian circles, absolutely the talk is all about when's the next clash with China going to happen. Abs absolutely. And this is the I in BRICS. Um, you know, South Africa, okay, you know, they play along with anyone. And, and Brazil has just gone from Bolsonaro, who couldn't be more pro-America, to Lula, who, of course, the White House thought would be pro-American if they were pro him winning. And of course, he's now heading off to Moscow, and going to, uh, sorry, heading off to Beijing and, you know, going to sign lots of deals over there, showing how wonderful the White House's foreign policy is and their understanding of the real world. Mm -hmm. um, but the constellation is volatile, politically doesn't hold together, culturally doesn't hold together. And as I said, economically doesn't hold together because you can't all run trade surpluses with each other in similar commodities. That doesn't make any sense. Okay, so it sounds like in, and I don't want to put words in your mouth here, but when this sort of boogeyman of this 
you know, BRICS coalition coming together to challenge Team America and the West and whatnot. You'll take the under on that bet. 100%. Now, that doesn't mean the West isn't playing the strongest hand in history really badly. It is. It's played parts of his hand unbelievably badly. And on a daily basis, you know, I, I exchange with uh, like-minded individuals who see the world the way that I do, just messages with each other. And we're just like facepalm on a daily basis. <laughs> just like, uh, how, you know, how can people not see what's going on? Why are they doing X, not Y? This just keeps happening. But that doesn't mean there aren't victories being clocked up. And that doesn't mean there aren't enormous problems, which you were just referring to, in each of these other economies. It's always very, very easy to make the other team look like giants and only see the flaws in your own team because you know your own team so much better than you do the others. And particularly when the others are relatively closed economies that have a vested interest in putting out you know, agitprop, which is right. extremely effective that makes us all think they're the greatest thing since sliced bread. Okay, that's great context to have. Um, and I've got to apologize. I have still so many questions for you. I, I'd like to keep you on for a little while longer, but I'm gonna be respectful of your time. No, no, and Michael, no we'll just have you back again, obviously. Um, <clears throat> so um, I, I wanna talk real briefly about um, uh, what's going on in, in Ukraine. Um, you know, that obviously was a big flashpoint that ex you know accelerated a lot of these trends that we're talking about here. Um, I did see a headline recently that um, Ukraine may be open to relinquishing Crimea, which of course is already fully under Russian control right now, but it was it was initially a never gonna happen uh, topic. Um, and so maybe, maybe, I don't know, I'm, I'm not a geopolitical uh, analyst like you, but maybe the door is starting to crack open to talks and you know we can all hope at some point in time, there's a negotiated settlement here. Um, I, I guess, let me ask you, uh, is a negotiated settlement possible here in 2023 from, from your perspective? It's very, very difficult. First of all, Ukraine appears to be on the cusp of launching a counteroffensive. So we'll see how effective that is and whether Russia can hold, hold up well against it or not. But you get a lot of disinformation from both sides, obviously, mm -hmm. always during war. The Russian, sorry, the Ukrainian population are very, very much opposed to that floated idea of a Crimea. So that would have to get past the people first of all. And I think the key thing to recognize is from the broader context, while everyone would like the war to stop as soon as possible, everybody would. If it stops more or less where we are now and Ukraine just cedes territory, well, that's what Russia's wanted from the very beginning. Right. And, and the fear in the more realpolitik parts of Europe is, okay, Russia takes its bruises, dusts itself down and says, okay, well, we mismanaged that one. Let's rebuild for five years and then go for round three. Because we've already, this is round two, not round one. And that's what the, the realists fear, because that's what the Russians are saying. You know, Dmitry Medvedev, former president, was tweeting just within the last 24 hours saying Ukraine will disappear. Here are the reasons why it will disappear. Now, of course, as I said, there's a lot of propaganda. But this doesn't suggest all we want is just this narrow slice of territory and then we're you know, peace, peaceful and loving and friends again, the way that France and Germany were post-World War II. And in fact, that's an analogy that Francis Macron, who's just come back from Beijing, making what many believe to be an enormous geopolitical error uh, again in, in having done so, he was tweeting and saying, look, you know, Ukraine, you've, you've got to get along with Russia the same way that we learned to get along with Germany post-1945. And he had to be reminded that's because Germany was defeated in 1945 and Hitler was dead. And at that point, with the Americans controlling a quarter of the country and the other major powers controlling the other parts of the country, yeah, on that basis, you could start reconciling. We ain't there yet. So nothing's impossible, but it doesn't look desperately likely to me, with great regret. Okay. Um, all right. I was, gonna, I was going to ask uh, if, if uh, well, I'll just ask it and let your response. Uh, let, let's just assume it is for a moment. Um, do you, how, how much do you see that sort of acting as a solve to uh, a calming effect to all the issues we've talked about? Um, negligible, very large, where on the spectrum do you think that that would, that would sort of quell the, the fracturing of, of what we've seen in terms of the geopolitical lines since the war started? 
Oh, depending on how it finishes, that's the key thing. But if it finishes with Russia keeping the territory it's already got now, and Ukraine running out of firepower because Europe and Europe in particular and America also says we can't keep propping you up, which I think is a, is, is definitely a possibility, then we pause for breath, we rearm, and we go for the next round on a much larger scale, either there or in other locations. And the parallel would be World War One to World War Two. Unfortunately, I don't think we're going to go that scale up, or I certainly hope not. Yeah. But the, you know, the risk would be exactly the same, that you would be not solving the problem that needed to be solved and basically leaving open wounds uh, that would fester and certainly sending messages to other regions that, you know what, if you're better prepared than Russia was, you can get away with this faster. Right. And the West, the West doesn't have the stomach to fight anymore. Yeah. And all it takes is, you know, 18 months of, uh, of willpower and you get what you want. Well, so let's let's use that as the jumping off point then to uh, the tensions between the U.S. and China. And obviously, you know, Taiwan plays a really important role in that. Um, would that make someone like a China feel more emboldened to say, hey, you know, what, West's kind of tired of of being involved in foreign conflicts. And so we, we take China here and, you know. Is America really going to go to war, World War Three, over us over this? I think those questions are already being asked now. Yeah, very, 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 really, they're being asked now. Now, America is constantly trying to say that, yes, we would. I mean, President Biden has said so in public, I think, twice or three times now. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's fairly unequivocal. But then it's always walked back immediately by the White House saying he didn't mean that, which is, you know, from abroad, that's a kind of a comical situation. It's either a joke of a country or everyone knows what the message really is, and this is just diplomatic pro forma to have yeah. to say so afterwards. Um, but depending again on how the Ukraine war ended, if it ends with Russia getting most of what it wants and then saying, and now we're still Im embittered and emboldened and we can rebuild with others, but not with the West. Yeah, you, you, the risk would be, I'm not making again any forecast, but the risk would be that certainly geopolitical strategists, national security experts are pretty unanimous if you read the in saying that's where the risks lie, that you would be sending the signal that, yep, go for it, because, you know, you've just got to be better prepared than Russia did. And already you've got Europe via Macron in the last couple of days, making abundantly clear, push comes to shove, we're not involved. Yeah. You know, he, he went to Beijing and said, Look, I'm not Taiwan, I'm not the US. I really don't want to discuss these things. He could have said this is a faraway land of which, a faraway country of which I know nothing, which was Neville Chamberlain, you know, prior to yeah. World War Two. And it, it would have been not dissimilar language. And the Germans are exactly the same. They just want to sell cars. Uh, so, you know, America's European allies are not in this, unfortunately. Okay. And so on this point, I've, I'm trying to remember who first made this point to me, and, and it very well may have been you again. Um, <laughs> but but uh, someone who I've interviewed in this channel in the past year has said, you know, it's not really like Ch China doesn't necessarily have to militarily invade Taiwan, uh, that the, you know, A, that's not their style, and B, uh, well, it comes with a lot of risk if they do it that directly, and C, it seems that the political winds in Taiwan may be blowing more than they have been in the past towards sort of a, a reconciliation. I don't want to use the word reunification, that might be too strong of a word, but at least a reconciliation with China, and so that China may get what it wants by playing a more patient long game, which does seem to be sort of China's general playbook. Um, I, I didn't that, say that, but I agree. I didn't say that, but I agree with it completely. Okay. Uh, every every step of what you just said, and obviously the next Taiwanese election coming up uh, early next year, I believe, is absolutely critical in that, and that we will see whether a party which will which will say if we keep going down this route, we all know where it's going to end, wins. Or whether a party that says, you know, we have to stand firm wins. And it, right now it's far too early to call that, you know, opinion polls this far out with geopolitics being as volatile as it is are not really worth very much. But it would be very interesting to see what happens either way. If you get, you know, the parties who are in favour of Taiwan standing firm emerging, that raises one set of risks. If you get the opposite, it reduces maybe the kinetic risk, but it increases the one that China getting what they want in a different manner, which then creates a whole new different set of issues for the US uh, and, and for the uh, 
for the global economy because it, it wouldn't end there even if we avoided the scenario that some people are fearing there would be huge ramifications in the geopolitical geoeconomic and market sphere for that happening too all right great again i, I could spend the whole time just talking about the single topic um real quickly before we we begin to wrap up with your market outlook um uh china has uh struck a deal uh recently with saudi arabia actually a number of deals with saudi arabia um but um uh, those countries seem to be moving much more closely together than they've been in the past in fact china's helped broker uh you know some uh reconciliations between Saudi and Saudi Arabia and Iran, and now it looks like Syria, which that was almost unimaginable, you know, a year or two ago. Um, how important are those developments uh, from a Western perspective? They're very significant in terms of the fact that it shows China wants to be a global player, really getting involved at a high level in every region, because the US wants out of the Middle East for understandable reasons. It didn't expect to be out of the Middle East and have China interjecting itself. And again, mm -hmm. the White House's diplomacy there has been ruinously bad on that particular front, in my opinion. Now, there'll be people who are passionately disagree with me and say it's been wonderful, etc. But I don't think anybody expected to see this happening. Is it sustainable? I question that. You know, the Iranians and the Saudis uh, have probably got a, you know, a, a dagger behind their back in one hand while they're shaking hands with the other. The Middle East is a region which specializes in betrayals and last minute twists and surprises like this one. Uh, and certainly, you know, there'll be, there'll be a fight for market share going forward, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there are any number of reasons to be to be skeptical. Um, but it, it's not good news uh, for the US, the way it's been organized so far. And we do have to keep our, our eye as the West on these things happening. And frankly, we need to up our game. You know, it, it's not enough to have beautiful rhetoric and do nothing. It's not enough to say, you know, we, we believe in uh, peace, love and apple pie. Uh, we, we need something that we bring to the table. And China, rightly or wrongly, brings a lot of money for infrastructure. Um, so we'll see. We'll see how the West responds going forward. But it, it's absolutely important to watch in terms of energy security, in terms of people collaborating together, possibly in terms over energy prices. Although, it's, you know, it's, it's debatable whether you'll genuinely get Saudi Arabian cooperation. But certainly you have the prospect now of a different kind of tension over both the, uh, you know, the Suez Canal and, and the Straits of Hormuz and um, not something that, you know, the Pentagon would have been planning for six months ago. But there you go. Crazy. Um, all right. God, I wish we had two more hours here, Michael. All right. Well, look, um, let me um, let me shift to uh, your, your market outlook here. Um, uh, you know, end of the day, the people who are watching these videos are trying to understand all the crazy puzzle pieces are in play. And you've given us a great view into the geopolitical side of things, which we really don't talk about enough on this channel, to be honest. Um, but they're just trying to figure out, okay, what do I do with this information, right? So um, as we look to the rest of this year, you know, we sort of danced around this topic of, you know, what, what central bank policy may be. Um, there's a lot of people out there that may, maybe I should get your, your thoughts on a few things first. Um, there's a lot of people out there who think that looking at the macro data, um, we are likely to be entering a recession at some point. And certainly if the central banks are continuing to try to destroy demand, that's the big risk that you run there. You destroy so much demand, you go into a recession. That may even be to a certain extent their, their objective. They're never going to say that publicly. Um, what kind of odds do you see of a, of a recession? I'll say in the US, but you can also opine globally if you think it's going to hit different parts of the globe differently. I think that's our interview with Michael will continue over in part two, which will be released on this channel tomorrow as soon as we're finished editing it. To be notified when it comes out, subscribe to this channel if you haven't already by clicking on the subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. And be sure to hit the like button too while you're down there. And don't forget that the replay videos of Wealthion's very excellent online conference from last month are still available for purchase at wealthion.com conference. And finally, if the challenges that Michael has detailed in this interview have you feeling a little vulnerable about the prospects for your wealth, then consider scheduling a free, no-strings-attached portfolio review by a financial advisor who can help manage your wealth 
keeping in mind the trends, risks, and opportunities Michael's mentioned here. Just go to Wealthion.com and we'll help set one up for you. Okay, I'll see you next over in part two of our interview with Michael Every.